My name's Lydia Cranston. I'm a member of the uh, Western North Island Pharma Council. Um, yeah, so as I said, Stephanie Honey. Um, she's the former Beef and Lamb Senior Manager of International Trade and has over 25 years' experience in international trade policy, including uh, as the Chief Agriculture Negotiator for the intensive phase of the World Trade Organization Doha round of negotiations. She's currently the Deputy Executive Director of APEC uh, Business Advisory Council and Associate Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum and sits on the board of the New Zealand Horticulture Export um, Authority. So this morning uh, she's going to present on navigating a, a changing global environment and so she'll talk for about 30 to 35 minutes and then we should have time for some questions after that. Cool. Over to you. Well, thanks, thanks very much Lydia for that kind introduction. Um, uh, I'm another pocket rocket, but I think I'm even shorter than Leanne. Um, also, you know, I have been doing this for 25 years. Obviously, I started when I was 12. Um, but uh, anyway, now we've got that, that out of the way. Uh, Lydia very kindly ran through my, my CV. And um, I guess, you know, it's a real privilege to be here. I was very fortunate to be able to take on the role of trade policy manager at Beef and Lamb uh, until recently for a little stint. But in fact, throughout my entire career in trade policy, uh, one thing that I've really learned through those many, many years um, in all those different roles is that the, the red meat sector in New Zealand ranks among the best in the world, if not the best. It's among the most innovative, the most efficient, the most sustainable, the most responsive to its customers. And, of course, it's a huge contributor to New Zealand's prosperity. If you were in the session just before with Leanne, you know, she said those, those big crunchy numbers don't really resonate with people. But I think we can take pride in the fact that if you're looking at the level of the, the global economy or the national economy, the New Zealand red meat sector is really up there. Now, we also know from the surveys of you, the farmers, that trade and international markets really matter. So, you know, it was a real privilege to have that role in trade policy and, and contribute in some small way to the success of the, the sector. So today what I'm going to take a look at is some of the challenges that the sector faces in this very complex and challenging and often quite turbulent global environment. I'm going to look at some of the impacts of, that we're facing today, so the, the pandemic and all those challenges around supply chain and some of the other points that, um, that Melissa Clark Reynolds mentioned. Also, unfortunately, something that is very, very familiar to anybody who's worked in New Zealand trade policy, which is protectionism, the P word around the world. Um, but I'll also look at some of the ways that the government has tried to create opportunities for the sector in overseas markets. So we've heard a lot already today about the sort of, um, you know, opportunities out there and what we can do with smart marketing and, and great on-farm practices and so on. But there's also a kind of cost centre around trade. And so the work that the government's done in trying to bring down that cost side of the equation and of course, the really key work that Beef and Lamb and working in partnership with the Meat Industry Association and the New Zealand Meat Board has done to actively help champion and support that effort. I'm going to wrap things up by looking at a couple of emerging trends. Um, and to some extent, in fact, Melissa Clark Reynolds and I are on the same page because I'm going to talk about what digital technology can do. But also um, the increasing interest in sustainability, so-called. Um, not only from consumers, but also it's something that we're seeing increasingly in trade policy as well. And like all good trends, both of those, digital and sustainability, have risks as well as opportunities for the sector. And then I'm going to finish with a few thoughts from my end about some of the qualities that will help the sector to be successful in this challenging global environment. And I, I guess the sort of key takeaway is it can't be business as usual. We really need to double down on some of the great qualities that the sector already has because we're facing a very challenging future picture. 
But let's start with a little bit of a success story. This is where you guys can all pat yourselves on the back. Um, in a nutshell, trade exporting is critical to the sector and it's something that you do extremely well from the pasture to the plates of your customers. So a few little stats there for you. New Zealand's biggest manufacturing se sector, our second largest export sector. Um, most of the exports are high value added premium products, which is obviously fantastic for returns. But also, really importantly, the sector has done extremely well in extracting the maximum value from every part of the animal. So you can see the co-products figure there. Um, that's a key part of maximising the returns from the, the products that we produce and going money going into your pockets as well as those of the processor. So obviously, you know, that's partly down to your hard work, the incredible efforts that I know everybody in this room puts into producing the best possible product, communication within and across the sector, working in partnership with the companies, the, the meat processors, and being smart about the marketing side, Taste Pure Nature, for example, that we've already heard about today. Now, you would have also seen on the previous slide that we export to around 120 countries. Now, that is true, but it's also true that that trade picture is pretty concentrated and you can see that on this graph. China, very dominant. Um, United States, EU, UK also are very significant. And then there's a second set of markets, some of those North Asian, you can see if you tilt your head, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, as, long as, as well as Australia and, and Canada are also really critical. And the top five of those markets account for about 75, 76% of our exports, the top 10 about 88%. So the sector's export profile is pretty narrow and that reflects some sound business decisions about where and how to get the best returns to go into farmers' pockets. Um, but it's also the case that today increasingly there's conversation about do we need to diversify? How do we do that? And that's where trade policy comes in. Now, the trading environment's also highly competitive, with a number of the big global exporters chasing market share in our most important markets, so the, the ones you can see there, including Australia, the US, Brazil, Argentina, the EU and Canada on beef, Australia on sheep meat. So it's not that we're just going out and selling to customers. We also have to compete against people who want to sell to those customers too. And all of that goes to demanding from our sector overall being smart, being nimble, and dare I say it, innovative, um, to respond effectively to that competitive environment. But we also need option, oh yes, sure, of course. Um, China would not have been on it. That is the really major change. Those top ones, this kind of old economy, USEU and so on, have always been really important to our sector. Um, China has just gone for the stars over the last few years. Um, since we signed an FTA with them back in 2008, which we've recently just upgraded, you know, that has really unleashed this amazing opportunity for us. But also there's been a massive demand in China. They're growing economically. They've got lots and lots of people who want to eat sophisticated protein products like red meat. So that's a really positive story for us. Sorry, is it um, that one is in terms of price, um, dollars. The volume picture is a little bit different, but you know you get the whichever way you cut it. There's a, quite a concentration in the markets that we sell to. But if you were looking at specific s sections of our trade, like co-products, it would look very different. You know, generally sort of lower lower value products. Um, so. Even though we're really concentrated, we also need optionality in markets. If there's a shock that affects one of our markets, for instance China, we need to be able to diversify if we need to. And so the work of beef and lamb, alongside, as I mentioned, the Meat Industry Association and the New Zealand Meat Board, is absolutely key to advocate for the government to make sure those doors are open. So if we need to go through them, we can, and I'll come back to that point later. So what is this turbulent trade environment that I talk about? Well, the, the coronavirus-shaped elephant in the room is, of course, the pandemic. And um, as, as we heard earlier in, in Andrew's comments and others, you know, the sector can be incredibly proud of how it performed despite the pandemic. Um, it was an essential service. It took a lot of hard work, careful management, close partnership with government. 
but basically the sector did incredibly well despite those challenges. And if you look at where we traded to through last year, there was quite a lot of flux in that, but that reflects the fact that the sector was able to be agile. Um, we could pivot when particular markets were closed or segments of markets were closed or disrupted, so food service, going into restaurants, for instance, or school meals or whatever, and sustain exports thanks to great relationships with our customers. Um, although last year's export figure, which was 9.3 billion, was slightly down on 2019 figures, it was still a significant increase over 2018 and the years preceding. So, I mean, that is fantastic. But there's still a downside risk from COVID. So we're likely to see ongoing disruptions to supply chains. I've seen a lot of media comments saying that's going to continue until 2022. Um, lots of countries are still battling the virus. Um, Lots of challenges around how people are responding to COVID, so we're starting to see a ramping up of testing requirements and so on, even when the science might still be out. And longer term, there's a risk to the global economy. Now, that really matters. Obviously, we can be as good as we like at producing high quality products, but if our customers don't have the money to spend, we're still going to feel a pinch. Um, and this is a chart from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which forecasts what's the global economy going to be doing over the next little while. And you can see in um, uh, some of our important markets, so those sort of old economy, Europe, North America, things aren't looking great. On the other hand, the, the poster child for incredible economic resilience, China and some of the other parts of, of emerging and developing Asia, so Southeast Asia, are going great guns. Now, what does this all add up to overall? Well, MPI has forecast that we are going to see a drop in meat and wool exports in the year ending June 2021, but a rebound um, the following year. Now, this kind of very challenging trade uh, performance is not unique to the New Zealand red meat sector. This is a chart from the World Trade Organisation um, and it shows how much goods trade there's been um, starting in 2015 and going, going sort of projecting out to 2022. And as you can see from this, um, there's been a pretty brutal uh, last year and a half for global trade. So check out that big deep V in the middle of the chart that spans the whole of 2020 and into Q1 of 2021. Now the big question which should be on the minds of all of us, is what's the, what's the long-term growth trajectory? So an optimist, a mild optimist, might say it's going to be the blue line, um, basically a modest return to growth. Potentially, if you were a super optimist, you might even get up to the green line. So that's going up to the old trend line from before the pandemic and, and some of the other factors we've seen in the last few years. But there's also a downside scenario and, you know, People who know me know that I always cup half empty. Let me get into some, you know, ca catastrophic thinking about this. Could we be facing that orange line where growth is essentially choked off by the pandemic out of control and the risk of countries turning inwards economically? Now, which trend line we see really matters, and there's stuff that we can do to try and help that, but it's it's going to be challenging. Unfortunately. The likelihood of the orange line really plays into some of the factors that we've seen coming out in the recent few years. So it used, when I started in trade, those 25 years ago, it used to be a given that we were moving slowly but surely to some sort of glorious future of more open markets and, and deeper economic inter integration and prosperity for everybody. And it was also a given that, okay, we might have our ups and downs and there might be some, you know, uh, some challenges, but basically everybody was on board for the journey. But that's not such a given anymore. Um, so in recent years, we've seen the UK wrench itself out of the European Union, people protesting in the streets, even in New Zealand, um, against trade deals like the TPP and the trade war between the US and China. So, you know, that orthodoxy is not necessarily still the case. Unfortunately, we've also seen a lot of that P word that I mentioned earlier, a backdrop of rising protectionism and economic nationalism. And this has really been a trend since the global financial crisis back in 2008. 
So this is some work from a, a website, Global Trade Alert, which keeps an eye on what's happening in sort of trade protectionism. And it shows all the trade restrictive actions that governments have taken since 2008. So that's the red line um, on that left-hand side. So as you can see, nearly 2,000 new harmful policy actions from governments over the last um, decade and a bit. Not just tariffs, um, but also so-called trade remedies, so that's like anti-dumping actions and subsidies. And unfortunately that's only been magnified by COVID. Um, Sense Partners, which is a New Zealand economic consultancy, uh, did some research recently and found that in the Asia-Pacific, countries introduced nearly uh, two dozen new trade barriers on food products last year in response to COVID. And some of those have certainly been removed, but about a third are still in place. And just on subsidies, um, that is a real headache. It's often not very obvious to those of us in New Zealand, but when you're trying to compete on, in markets with, with subsidised producers, you're really operating on an unlevel playing field. I mean, to put it in kind of very crude terms, it's quite hard for a farmer in the Manawatu to go head to head against the treasuries of Europe and the United States. To put some dollars around it, as I've done on the slide, we're talking about on average 708 billion US dollars in support a year. And often those subsidies, the kind of subsidies that they are, don't just distort trade, but also incentivise kinds of production that have a heavy environmental impact. So it's kind of a lose-lose. Now, one of the ways that New Zealand has tried to fight for a more level playing field is through the World Trade Organisation that I mentioned before. I mean, sorry, in advance, trade policy is just loaded with acronyms, which, you know, is my, my language that I speak, but please stop me if I use one that you, um, you haven't come across and I forget to explain. So the WTO, World Trade Organisation, has 164 members, so including New Zealand and essentially all of our major trading partners. And it matters because it provides a set of global rules. So everybody's agreed to these rules and everybody has agreed to stick to them. And it also provides a way to enforce our rights if people don't stick to them. And for us as a sector, there's been a huge benefit from that WTO system. So the WTO has essentially opened the door into those markets where we might not have trade deals. So that for us includes the United States, EU and UK. You remember those are really important markets for us. It's gone some way, not far enough, but some way to curbing the worst distorting effects of subsidies. And importantly for us, it's also put in place some really good frameworks about how people design the so-called non-tariff measures. So things like food safety rules, um, making sure that they're based in good science, clear frameworks around the way that labelling requirements have to be developed and, you know, kind of trying to encourage people to use internationally accepted norms and so on. Um, all of that matters to kind of the dollars that end up in your pocket at the end of the day. And I mentioned it, it allows rules to be enforced. So for New Zealand, even though we're tiny, in the middle of nowhere, down at the bottom of the planet, we've actually been able to take other countries to court and win even much bigger countries like the United States, where we won a case against them on sheep meat, and Indonesia for beef. So, you know, for a small, open, distant economy like New Zealand, it really matters. But unfortunately, over the last decade or so, the WTO has been in pretty heavy water. So the most recent round of uh, trade negotiations, as Lydia mentioned, the Doha round, made progress until 2008. Incidentally, when I stopped working on it, I don't know if there's any, uh, you know, kind of link to be drawn there, but, um, at, but unfortunately at that point it was, became clear that there just wasn't the political will of the membership, so New Zealand and all the other members, to get to yes. And that's a real pity, because it would have been better outcomes on things like those subsidies I talked about. As far as the dispute settlement piece goes, as I mentioned, really important for us to defend our rights. The court of highest resort in that, in that system, called the appellate body, has been slowly strangled by the United States. Um, the Trump administration sort of put the final nail in the coffin, but actually it's been kind of a US position for quite a number of years. And the US was very critical about the way this appellate body operated. They thought it was going further than, it, than its mandate and so on. Anyway, long story short, it's not in operation anymore, and that means our ability to defend our, you know, bought and paid for rights uh, internationally is weakened. 
And now there's also an immediate test of credibility. How's the WTO responding to the pandemic? Can we use trade rules to help get us out of this terrible situation? So there's a real credibility problem there. Now, that's not a great story, but I'm pleased to report that there's a, an outstanding new Director General at the helm. She's a very dynamic um, uh, woman, the first woman at the head, um, who's come into the job with real energy. And so her drive combined with some quite positive signals now from the Biden administration and the EU about you know really wanting to get some stuff done at the WTO may mean that things come right there. Now, I hope I've thoroughly depressed everybody in the room. That's, you know, job done for a trade policy person. But I'd like to change gears a little bit and actually strike a more positive note. Because even though we're facing a very turbulent environment, there's actually a lot of opportunity out there as well. Of course, with risk and, and, and challenge also comes along opportunity. And I'd like to talk about some of that. And I'm going to start with FTAs. Um, sorry, another acronym there, free trade agreements. They're not actually about you know, free trade, um, and often they actually seem to be going beyond what trade is as well. But anyway, that's the acronym we're stuck with, trade deals. Now, we're very fortunate in New Zealand to have an amazing portfolio of trade deals that help to create opportunities for the red meat sector. What do these things do? Well, they open up markets, so they open that door to go through and they reduce trade costs. So even when we're in the market, it's easier, cheaper, um, more efficient to do trade uh, in, in those markets. Now, Beef and Lamb did some great numbers uh, a few years ago, um, which are in the process of being um, updated, but they calculated back in 2018 that the red meat sector had saved over $350 million in tariff costs a year, thanks to those FTAs. I mean, that's pretty spectacular. But unfortunately, they also worked out that we're still paying about $250 million each year. So there's clearly still a job of work to be done. Um, there are definitely going to be improvements in the new figures, but there are still going to be too many zeros attached to the tariffs paid figure. So we need to work to do uh, to support the government's efforts in negotiating new trade deals. And I know from my time at Beef and Lamb, and I, and I am very confident going into the future, getting that new trade deals piece right and improving what we've got on the table now is a really core part of what the trade team does at Beef and Lamb. So existing FTAs cover about 60% of, of our exports, and that figure would rise to nearly three quarters if we got the current deals that are under negotiation across the line. That's with the EU and UK. Um, but that's not enough. There's still work to be done. We need to upgrade the old deals, especially to make sure that we're still on a level playing field with our competitors in key markets. And ideally, we'd also like to expand some of those existing FTAs. So you'll see a few nice little acronyms in the middle there, CPTPP, RCEP, PACER Plus. Um, I won't, you know, torture you with, with spelling those out, but in, in shorthand, in order, we could potentially have United States, India, and some of our South Pacific customers in that mix too, which would obviously be great, not only to reduce costs, but also to enhance that optionality I talked about earlier. Um, now, this is definitely something for the long game. There's quite a big lag between the gleam in the eye and actually getting that trade deal across the line. And it's also the case that lots of new FTAs will increase the complexity for exporters. Uh, we have a great term in trade policy, which is the noodle bowl. Um, so untangling that noodle bowl is not always straightforward. Um, and that's where the WTO comes in too. But as I say, that's, that's also part of the longer game. So in the short term, we've got two really key FTAs to get across the line. First one is with the UK, um, and the second one's with Europe. And together, those markets, not that they are together anymore, are worth nearly $2 billion. So this really matters. Now, with the UK, um, we've heard a lot so far today about kind of values and, and so on. When it comes to high quality, sustainable, animal welfare friendly red meat production, we're very much on the same page with the UK. I mean, I think we would probably say that we're actually a, a notch above the UK on a lot of that stuff. Um, but I'm pleased to report that the UK's Independent Trade and Agriculture Commission recently recommended that the UK should lower its tariffs to zero for countries um, that can meet similarly high standards as, as are required of British farmers. Now, New Zealand would seem to be the ideal candidate for this. 
Unfortunately, however, at least as, as far as we understand it, the UK is so far failing, shall we say in diplomatic speak, to demonstrate this ambition and what it's prepared to put on the table. So beef and lamb and MIA and, and farmers have a really important job in, in keeping their feet to the fire on that. Similarly with the EU, um, it's an internationally competitive exporter of red meat. It competes with New Zealand. It will have a shortfall in meeting its huge domestic demand. But again, the reports from the negotiations say that it's really dragging its feet. Um, so the sector really needs to support the government's efforts in getting great outcomes in these trade deals. Now, the other uh, sort of challenge that we face, which also gives us opportunities, is around these things called NTBs. Acronym alert. These are non-tariff barriers, which are kind of like the red tape, if you like, that add cost um, for exports. Now, some of these measures might start out with legitimate aims, like protecting consumers, or, you know, food safety or whatever, but the way that measures are designed might go further than it needs to, might be just badly designed and add more cost than they need to, or actually might just be outright protectionist. And the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research did some calculations a few years ago. That's that big chunky number you can see on the screen. Um, New Zealand exporters are paying around $6 billion a year in non-tariff measures for their exports to the APEC region. Now, not all of those are barriers as opposed to legitimate measures, um, and not all of them are paid by the beef sector. Our share is about 800, or the red meat sector, it's about $800 million, although that was based on, on sort of historic trade, so it's likely to be higher today. But whatever the number, this is clearly a problem. And what are we talking about? Well, I've put a few of the, the kinds of things NTBs are for our sector up on the screen there. One of the important things that FTAs do is try to reduce the scope for NTBs. Um, so they try to streamline the trade rules, hold other countries to the kinds of standards and, and practices in developing regulation that we adhere to, for example, and where possible reduce those requirements. So in terms of what does that mean for the sector, it means we can get a higher premium, we can respond better to our customers, in some cases we can actually access markets. Um, so this really matters. And to give you a little illustration of how it matters, the orange bit of this chart is the tariff, so that's the tax you pay at the border. The blue part is a kind of the dollar equivalent of the tariff that's represented by these non-tariff barriers or measures. And as you can see, I've, well, you probably can't see because it's so tiny, but trust me when I say um, those two bars that I've circled there are for um, basically uh, beef and sheep um, and, <coughs> pardon me, associated products. Um, and you can see that the blue bars, so that's the non-tariff barrier part, vastly outweighs the tariffs. And remember, those tariffs, we're still paying $250 million. So you can see the kind of burden on the sector is significant. Um, now, bottom line, what does this mean? Well, it means that um, there's got to be a lot of hard work trying to get at these non-tariff barriers as well. And again, that's something that I know Beef and Lamb um, is, is very active in advocating for. Now, another big non-tariff barrier, and again, this is a topic that we've talked about a lot already today, is sustainability or, or climate, climate change. So you might wonder, what on earth is she talking about? How, what does this have to do with trade or, or non-tariff barriers? Well, this is one of those areas where we're starting to see provisions relating to sustainability or climate change being imposed either at the border or in markets. Now, clearly, the goal, at, at least in some ways that are expressed, might be legitimate or is legitimate. But the way that measures are designed is not always sound. It's not always based on science. Um, in some cases, there's an expectation that there's a single way to achieve those goals without taking account of different ways that other countries might achieve them. Um, and the net effect is that these measures might both fail to meet the goal of sustainability or, or mitigating climate change, and from our perspective, might also have a pretty chilling effect on trade. The more complex the measure, and I think we are starting to see some incredibly complex measures out there like border carbon adjustment and so on, the more complex, the more scope there is for disguised protectionism, that P word again. 
So for example, we might start to see requirements for embedded sustainability. You have a piece of meat, how is it produced? If it doesn't meet my test, it's not coming into my market. Bottom line is if farmers don't get this right and meat processors don't get this right and New Zealand overall doesn't get this right, we might find ourselves out of a market. Now that is not a reflection on how well we're doing, it might just be that the approaches that our trading partners are using are not exactly the same as ours. So there's a really important job of work there to advocate for good science, to advocate for this idea of equivalence that we see in a lot of biosecurity stuff, that our way is also a good way, um, and to make sure that we're not inadvertently shut out of markets on this basis. On the other hand, the incredible work that the New Zealand farm sector already does in this space, and particularly plaudits to the red meat sector in this, we can actually potentially leverage the sector's hugely impressive economic uh, environmental performance to secure that premium slice of the market. And, and I think this was a point that Melissa Clark Reynolds made this morning as well. Now, what does this look like in practice? Well, um, we've seen this played out in vivid colour um, in, in respect of the EU's current negotiations or, or recently concluded negotiations with a number of countries in South America, the Mercosur countries, foremost among them Brazil. Um, you, if you're a French reader, you might be able to read, um, this was a, a photo taken in Brussels, the sort of beating dark heart of the EU. Um, there are tractors there driving down the big main drag there and um, they've got a sign on the tractor that says, Mercosur doesn't respect our climate, your, uh, your, your climate, your health, and, and your farmers, or our farmers. So it's basically hammering against this trade deal, which, by the way, Mercosur got 99,000 tonnes of beef, so it's not a small deal, um, saying basically, we don't want a piece of that because they, they are not good actors on the climate. Um, now, there was a huge domestic backlash from consumers and NGOs, which had a really uh, big impact on policymakers in the EU. Um, and although that deal has been concluded, because of essentially Amazonian deforestation and this, you know, racking up of consumers, it's quite likely that the Mercosur deal will not be ratified, at least for a few years. Um, and we're seeing in our own negotiation with the EU, it's, it's already had a kind of policy position that they want to have a chapter on trade and sustainable development in, in FTAs, and you know we're certainly not afraid of that. We have got a fantastic record ourselves, and we actively want more enforceable rules than the EU on things like fossil fuel subsidies or, or fish subsidies. Um, but recently, the EU has also talked about a new chapter that they're going to put in, including in the New Zealand FTA, on sustainable agriculture. So we're going to need to be watching that space very carefully. Not that we have anything to be ashamed of, but we don't want to find ourselves on the wrong side of an EU sort of uh, operating manual there. Um, and I know that that's something that Beef and Lamb is going to be watching very closely in the period ahead. And of course, we've got a great story to tell here. I mean, thanks to the hard work of, of you in this room, um, and Andrew mentioned this morning, Hewaka Ekenoa, the on-farm carbon sequestration, the broader environmental stewardship that's absolutely fundamental to the way New Zealand red, red meat farmers, you know, produce. Um, and of course, the impressive reduction in emissions that the sector has achieved over the last 30 years. But these aren't necessarily going to be the models or the metrics that the EU is going to insist on. So there's potentially an opportunity here to leverage those great environmental credentials, but also a risk, and it's going to take very careful navigation to use the, the, the title of my speech. Now, another emerging trend is digital. I, I was going to say you might think you've stumbled into the wrong room here, but I'm pleased to say Melissa Clark Reynolds has already, you know, broached that crazy question of why are we talking about digital at a, an agriculture conference, and of course, digital transformation is changing everything. Um, I mean, who doesn't have a smartphone in this room? Who hasn't done a video conference or streamed Netflix? Um, but it's also changing the way we farm and and distribute and trade in in agriculture. So I've put a few of these ideas on the slide. I'm afraid I'm not quite as jazzy and, and impressive as Melissa Clark Reynolds. I, I like to use a few more, you know, laborious words, but you can see throughout the value chain, essentially from on the farm right through to the consumer, there's huge opportunity from digital technology in terms of cost saving, 
trade enabling and value creating. And I mean, I think on that value creating side of things and going back to what I've just been talking about, we can use digital technologies to achieve essentially verifiable product attributes. So a customer can scan a pack of meat in a supermarket and know that it was produced you know, consistent with our, our values and so on back home in New Zealand. Maybe even showing that new New Zealand logo, although I'm sure there's still a bit of work to be done on that. Um, and of course, at the back end of the shop, you as farmers will know only too well, you don't want to be killed by the costs. Um, so there are potential savings there. When it comes to trade, there's e-commerce, some of that crazy whiz-bang stuff that Melissa was talking about. But even using conventional channels, um, there are huge cost savings, things like electronic certification for sanitary certs or electronic bills of lading. And this can also help to reduce some of those other non-tariff barriers, the mischief making, if you like, at the border that I talked about earlier. But with risk and opportunity, those things go together. There's also a bit of a job of work to do. So it will take investment on farm and throughout the value chain in the necessary infrastructure, and also work to untangle what we're increasingly seeing as sort of a digital noodle bowl of conflicting rules and regulations. Um, essentially, we need digital to be interoperable in all our markets and with New Zealand and on farm to work optimally. So I'm just drawing to a little bit of a close here, and I guess I thought when I was putting these slides together, you know, what, what kind of message of hope can I leave you with? Because I do think there's real cause for optimism. I mean, as, as we heard at the beginning of the day, the sector has performed fantastically, even in, I mean, could anybody have imagined a more challenging environment than COVID? So it's something that where there's real cause for pride. Um, but our goal clearly shouldn't just be to get through the worst of the problems, but actually to thrive and deliver a sustainable pro and prosperous future um, for our communities. So as I've explained uh, at some length, you know, we've got a very competitive and turbulent and disrupted trading environment um, and challenges abound. But also there are opportunities that we can uncover, whether from new FTAs or expanded FTAs that help to reduce our trade costs, from leveraging our environmental credentials, from innovations in digital technology. But what's clear is that, you know, at the end of the day, trade comes down to people. And it's what qualities people in the sector have really matter. So, you know, some of the things that I think really count are agility, and we've already seen that demonstrated through COVID, understanding and staying connected and responsive to customers and markets, something that we already do really well, but we need to keep, keep at it. A strong story to tell. Again, you guys have ticked that box. And an innovative mindset because things are changing all the time. But above all, it will take grit and resilience that have been the hallmark of the sector throughout its history. That's it from me. Thank you. Um, well, look, I, I love nothing better than a trade challenge, but, you know, that's just me. Um, I think it has been a hugely worrying time, actually, and I know that the folk in Wellington have spent a lot of sleepless nights worrying about how we're going to get through. Um, it's also taken a lot of hard work, and quite a bit of that has been behind the scenes. As Andrew acknowledged uh, this morning, you know, MPI has actually really put in the mahi to get all those pandemic protocols right. I know that MFAT has put in endless, endless hours and, and manpower to making sure that markets stay open, that supply chains keep working. You know, they've, um, the government overall has put money into sort of uh, air freight transport and so on. So, I mean, it's exciting, it's worrying, it's exhausting, and, you know, because I love the carp half empty. Unfortunately, we're not out of the woods yet. You know, the, you get a little bit blasé in New Zealand, but in a lot of the rest of the world, the pandemic is still on fire. So, you know, it's, it's a tough time, but it's also, you know, this is what we do. 
we face adversity and we find the we find the opportunity and we go for it. And I think that that's what this sector can do as well. There's never been a better time to be producing healthy, sustainable, nutrient dense nourishment. Um, and we've got a lot of you know hungry hungry trading partners on our doorstep in the Asia Pacific who want to buy that. Absolutely, they do. Look, I mean, you can understand from a consumer point of view, it seems like a great idea, but actually our entire history has been based on being the world's, you know, kind of food basket. And um, I think particularly as we face the climate change challenge as well, you know, that, that logo, if you were in the previous session, you know, best, best beef and lamb in the world, that is true. If you want to get food that is produced in the way that, you know, accords with your values, well, New Zealand's the place to get it. So I think that narrative is very uncomfortably, you know, fits very uncomfortably with that idea of buy local. And we see it already in some of the big, you know, the Biden administration, I think there was a general sense, if, I, if I'm not being too undiplomatic, that, you know, thank goodness we don't have President Trump running trade policy in the US anymore. But unfortunately, one of the first things that President Biden has done is set up an office for Buy American. You know, that's a really important market for our beef um, and for our lamb, and we do not want to see them saying, yep, uh, when we're putting big contracts together for school meat or whatever, we're going to buy local. We want them to keep buying the best product in the world, which is from New Zealand. So great question. It is a real issue, um, and I think we just need to keep keep telling the story that we have, which is really strong. Yeah, good stuff, Stephanie. Thank you. Yep. At the risk of being a bit negative, Please. how much risk is there in us being um, so reliant on China for, you know, 30% of our trade by volume in a history which shows that there's probably downside risk from that, and how much of that increase in that Chinese market has been a result of other people's misfortune, like the, the swine fever mm. thing, you know, I'm going to put this on paper, but it's, yeah. you know, well, look, a few things going on there. First of all, it's it's true we are very heavily weighted towards China, um, but equally, I think we saw through through the early days of COVID when China was essentially shut, that actually companies and and New Zealand was able to pivot pretty impressively actually to supply other markets. I think to me, you know, there's a lot of talk from governments and others saying, oh, we've got to diversify, but actually, you know, they're not the ones doing the business and putting the money in their pocket or not. There's no reason to think we can't be maximising returns to farmers and companies from selling to China. But equally, we need to be sure that we've got options, not necessarily that we're diversifying today, but if we need to, we can pivot, whether it's you know to Europe or whatever, or some of these incredible emerging markets that we're seeing, uh, you know, India or some of the South Asian markets, the Middle East or Africa, you know, that have this massive growing middle class. So I think that's that's where the, the trade policy work comes in. I mean, I would say that, of course, but, you know, and, and the work that Beef and Lamb does in advocating for more open markets so that if something goes wrong in one market, I mean, COVID wasn't a very good uh, case study for that because the whole world went, you know, kind of imploded. But if something goes wrong in one market, we've got the options to pivot. And I'm sorry, what was the other question? Oh, that's right, other people's misfortune. Well, there's no question, you know, Melissa Clark Brennell talked about the novel zoonoses. You know, thank you, African swine fever. I'm just uh, being a little bit facetious there, but, you know, that has been great for us. There has been a shortfall in global protein, and particularly in pork. Um, but equally, you know, it's not just that people of desperation gone to New Zealand red meat. It's because we have a fantastic product. And also because I'm a trade policy person, I'd say it's because we've got an FTA with China that's really opened the door as well. And we've recently just upgraded that to strip out even more costs and make us more competitive. Are we exporting really meat and dairy products to India? Um, very, very few, unfortunately. 
and that is a real regret. Um, that is one of those markets, if you look at the sort of world league tables, it's enormous. It's going to have an enormous wealthy middle class who want to buy protein. Um, and so it's a, a very frustrating that um, we haven't been able to sell more. The reason is, particularly sheep meat, well, only sheep meat, the reason is that unfortunately they're very protectionist. So they've got a, a tariff of 30%, you know, that's like a tax on every kilo of meat that goes in there of 30% of the value, um, which means that it's a very, you know, poor sort of economic equation to try to sell products to India. Um, and we almost got a trade deal with India through one of those acronyms I mentioned, RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Unfortunately, the last minute India decided to pull out, they, they had some concerns about what the, the FTA was going to do. It, that was with you know a number of other regional partners, not just New Zealand. So, but that's definitely on the list. I know for beef and lamb, it's one of our big things that sort of chipping away uh, to try to get the access there. Be great if we could open up that opportunity and great for, for Indian consumers too, particularly in the sort of the tourism trade and so on. But of course, they're having a pretty horrendous time right now. So with COVID, uh, so that's probably a sort of slightly longer term objective. Could you just remind us uh, for perspective again, what percentage of the world sheep and beef market will buy? Um, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but I know that it's tiny, single digits, um, in terms of production. In terms of trade, it's also small, but it's bigger. But um, that also reflects the fact that uh, globally, there is not a lot of you know accessible market because of protectionism. So a lot of countries produce and then sell domestically rather than trading. But in the, the trade league table, we're, we're pretty high up there on the sheep meat side in particular little further down the table on the, the beef side, but, but you know. Another question I asked in the last talk also, how important is that differentiation of, and, do, and is there enough of it, of, of where, where this product's from when it gets overseas? We hear a lot of stories, in fact, a lot of the product has been cut overseas. Is there enough differentiation in, in, when, it, when our meat gets to marketplace of where it comes from? Well, gosh, I, th I think you'd, you'd want to ask the marketers about that. But what I would say is that, you know, we need to maximise the returns from every animal and every part of every animal. And clearly part of that story is around not only the, the quality of the product, but also the story we tell around that. And so things like Taste Pure Nature, which really leverage those, those quality attributes and product attributes, I think has, has helped us to take a sort of premium slice of the market. Um, and, you know, so clearly I know that that's something that, that the marketing part of Beef and Lamb spends a lot of time thinking about and, and trying to figure out how to, how to do that in a smart way. Right, we'll have to um, wrap it up there. I am, yes. Yep, so if you have more questions, just come in your chat. Um, thank you very okay. much. Well, th thanks very much for the opportunity. It's a real pleasure to be here.